The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. Awesome. Okay, let's get this started. Uh, welcome everybody to uh, current topics in media computing and human computer interaction, CTHCI for short. Um, this is a very unique class because we're recording this live in a Zoom video call. So um, bear with us if things don't work quite as smoothly as uh, we want them to. Uh, we've practiced this a bit beforehand and we hope that we can get everybody through this. Thanks for joining live here. Uh, means a lot. I, I would love to talk to you guys during this class and interact as much as possible with this. On this first page, as always, you always you already know our classes, most of you I would expect. Um, you can see the jump page of the class and uh, that is sort of the most important uh, URL to remember. If you only remember one, then this is the one. So it's our homepage slash CTHCI. If you go to that, this will take you to everything else um, that we will be referring to in this, um, in this class. All right, so um, how is this gonna work? Um, before we start with the class itself, a little bit of um, video conferencing etiquette to help us have a good experience here. Um, first of all, I would like this to be an interactive class as much as possible. This is why we chose uh, the option that everybody could join this class um, with a full connection and not just a, a webinar where you just basically hang out in, a, uh, in, an, in an audio call or something. So um, if you don't mind, please turn on your video uh, so that we can see each other just like in the classroom. Um, it's perfectly fine if you want to hide your messy bedroom uh, behind the uh, Golden Gate Bridge, uh, like uh, uh, this gentleman here is doing. Um, just, um, you know, oops, just make sure that we can see you so that we can uh, interact with you and, and see whether there are any questions. So thanks for joining us with your video. Um, be, um, be assured that uh, while I can see you right now and you can see each other, hopefully, uh, just as, as in class, uh, we will not be recording your video in the lecture recording. The recording, the lecture is being taped, um, but your video frames will not be in there. Also, in the interest of interactivity, I would love to uh, have you guys ask questions. Um, again, even if you ask a question and your video pops to the front, maybe in, in the view or something, uh, this will not be in the lecture recording. Only your audio will be on there. Um, so that we don't talk over each other, um, which is always a little trickier in video conferencing than in real life, um, please use the uh, raise hand function in Zoom. All right. Um, so this is the best way for you to, um, if you want to ask something or, or, or make a comment, just raise the hand. Um, if I don't see it directly, um, Anke will, and she'll interrupt me if I, if I overlook it. Uh, that's the best way for you guys to speak up. Um, and um, then, of course, you unmute yourself. Uh, while you're not um, asking a question or saying something, um, please mute your microphone um, so that we can avoid the dreaded echo effects that uh, often plague video conference. Um, should you forget to mute yourself, this is easy to forget, especially after you ask the question and, and you're all excited, uh, then we may do this for you. Um, please don't take this the wrong way. We don't want you to shut up. We just um, know that it's easy to forget. So you might find yourself um, being muted by Anke if she notices that somebody forgets that. Um, and then finally, a uh, great idea if you um, are sharing your video with us uh, to also turn on your lights so you don't look like a, like a zombie. Um, that's just the general uh, good idea to have as many lights as possible uh, shining at you. I'm actually looking behind my screen here is a daylight window with sunshine and I have another lamp on the right hand side and another lamp on the left hand side just to make sure that there is enough light in the, in the picture. General good idea if you are on video conferences, which you're probably a lot these days. All right, um, next up. Um, who's uh, in the team this semester? Um, I'm gonna be giving the initial classes and then some of the um, uh, further classes as well. Uh, and Anke, who you already met, is uh, the teaching assistant for this class. So any questions you have about this class, um, technical questions, sign up questions, assignment questions, um, please contact Anke. 
um, try not to email me unless there's a problem that you cannot resolve with her. The simple reason for this is I'm getting so much email that yours might get drowned in the flow uh, and I will probably not be able to get back to you as quickly as Anka can. So emails please to her. Um, this uh, semester, this class will be unusual in that you'll also meet a couple other PhD students and a couple other uh, research and teaching assistants of our lab uh, that are listed below, Sebastian, Arian, Krishna, Oliver, Marcel, and uh, Philip. Uh, and I'll get to what they will be doing in just a second. So the goals for this class, um, this is an, a really interesting advanced class that a lot of other universities are um, envious about. I know a lot of students would like to have a class like this in their curriculum um, because we really get down to the nuts and bolts of how research in HCI is being done. So um, most of you have probably attended DIS-1. In fact, maybe, um, Anka, do you want to run a quick poll if anybody, um, yeah, we can try this out now. We'll run a quick poll with you guys um, here with Zoom to see um, if you attended DIS-1 before or whether you have not attended Designing Active Systems 1 just yet. Um, this class will let you practice how to actually retrieve information from the research literature and how to evaluate it, how to know whether a paper is good or, or whether it's you know, not so great. I mean, published papers should usually fulfill some standards, but there are better conferences and, and, and less exciting ones uh, that have lower standards of acceptance. So this is an ideal preparation um, for your own thesis writing, um, especially, of course, if you're thinking about doing this at our lab, which I'd be excited about, um, but also in general. And um, if you decide to continue a career of research, whether it's you know, in industry or academia, um, then this will also be an excellent preparation for this because you will be able to read and competently assess research literature um, which is, you know, the language we all speak. This is the knowledge base that we all um, share and live on as a, as a research community worldwide. After giving you these sort of tools of the trade so that you know how to work with um, HCI literature, um, we'll dive into uh, the latest and greatest. So we will share with you some up-to-date developments in human-computer interaction um, that will, uh, that we have, uh, that we've created surveys of. Um, I'm being distracted because on my secondary screen here, uh, a question just popped up whether I have attended DIS-1 before. Yes, I have actually. Let me uh, confirm that. Um, so uh, the, the up-to-date research developments in, in, you know, at, at CHI, the biggest conference in, in the world on HCI and other up-to-date conferences, um, this is what we are looking at. And we're looking at it, of course, with a lens through our interests in HCI, which are a little more maybe on the technical side, uh, since we are a computer science lab after all. Uh, but if you, it'll give you a good idea of the topics that are currently, um, you know, getting tossed around in the HCI research community. And, and here's the trick. This is also a wonderful, it's almost like, a, you know, Germany's next top model for um, PhD students because all our PhD students will be giving short overviews of these research areas. And each student um, has picked an area that they find exciting themselves. Um, of course, they don't just talk about their own work. That would be uh, boring and limited. Uh, but it's a chance to actually see quite a few different um, papers and approaches on a topic um, that was, you know, that was that has been recently in much discussion. So this is why I think this is a great uh, this is a great class to attend because you basically get uh, all our PhD students up there on the catwalk and they will tell you what they're interested in, what they're excited about. But you can also judge whether it's maybe a topic and a person that you'd love to work with for your own, you know, thesis that you might be writing. So. Um, who you are or who you should be, let's put it that way. Um, this class is directed mostly at um, Master of Science uh, students in computer science, media informatics, software systems engineering. So our big classes in, uh, in CS and related areas at the master's level. This is clearly a research class, um, clearly an advanced class um, 
probably the most advanced one from a research point of view that we're teaching. Um, but you're also welcome to attend, it, attend this if uh, you're a bachelor of science student. Uh, you can do this for extra credit in your bachelor's or you can carry it over and sort of, you know, um, listen to it now and have it um, accredited to your master's later. Um, also, of course, bachelor's and master's students in technical communication um, are also very welcome in this class, um, especially if you have a focus on computer science and HCI research that you're interested in. Um, a, um, a second question here uh, is, uh, what should you have heard before? Um, really, the biggest thing is that you should know about designing interactive systems one. And I just saw the results of the poll, which were uh, a little bit maybe shocking. Uh, it looks like about half of you guys um, have not attended DIS one before. Um, does that sound about right, Anke? Yes, that's about right. So it's 15 people that said no, and 12 said yes. Not all have answered, but almost the half, half of them, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, this does not mean that we kick you out of the class, um, but it may mean that you know you have to uh, do a little bit of extra work and go over the video recordings from DIS1, which are very well structured. They're cut up into small parts and chapters, um, so you can listen to individual topics that we bring up. Um, we expect people to know the key things from DIS1 in our labs, in our assignments and the exams. So if you've never heard it and never touched it, then it might be a really good idea uh, to brush up on that. Um, as we go through the class, you will see whether something seems very strange to you. Sometimes I, I will mention, that, oh, this was covered in DIS1, not all the time. If you don't know something, ask your fellow students, ask Anke, uh, whether this was covered in DIS-1, check maybe the list of DIS-1 topics yourself. DIS-1 is the, the introduction to human-computer interaction um, and sort of lays the foundation of understanding how people interact with technology and how good user interfaces work. Probably the most important class we teach um, for the widest audience. It's got a, like 150 uh, attendees or something. Uh, it's taught in winter, so it just happened last semester. It will be happening ne again next semester. Um, but you can follow along and, and catch up on some of the topics using our recorded materials. Okay, um, now um, if you are not from any one of those programs that I've just listed, I'd love to hear from you. Um, so can you raise your hand if you are not in one of those programs? Because we usually always have a few people who are from different um, degrees. Uh, there's uh, Suroj and uh, Iris. Uh, Suroj, do you want to uh, speak up. You'll have to unmute yourself and just tell us uh, what master's or, or bachelor student uh, program you're in. Uh, do you have my sound? Yes, we do. Uh, I'm from the uh, master program electrical engineering. Ah, okay. MSc electrical engineering. Welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, did you get a chance to listen to uh, DIS-1 already, or was that not on your list yet? No, no, I didn't have the course. Okay, all right. Well, maybe some catch-up to do, but you'll be fine. Um, yeah. And Iris, I think, as well. Uh, I'm from Master Electrical Engineering, too, and I didn't take DIS-1 either. Okay. okay. Well, welcome to you guys. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, okay, now this is... You can, you can take your hand down now. It's okay. Yep, there you go. <laughs> awesome. All right, this is working. Um, some administrative stuff, really quickly. Uh, the format of this class is, um, it's a 6 CTS class, as you probably all know. The lecture is happening right now, every Tuesday from 10.30 to 12. Uh, we have a lab every Wednesday from 12.30 to 2. So make sure to keep both those time slots open in your, in your uh, academic schedule. Um, and uh, this is just three hours, um, but as you know, with you know, with ECTS, there's a certain workload uh, associated, and we uh, know from experience that you can expect to work roughly nine hours per week in total on this class. Uh, the lecture and lab is three hours total. Um, we'll have weekly reading assignments for uh, you know, readings, required readings, and also assignments to work on and write your own stuff. Um, and that will probably take about another five hours each week. Um, and then uh, you may also find that we have some 
peer reviewing and um, uh, project work that you'll be doing that's also roughly an hour a week. Some of this will be happening in groups um, and uh, we expect you guys to just sync up yourselves uh, with, your, with your mates um, using, again, using online platforms like, like Zoom or whatever you prefer. Here are some examples of the topics that we will be touching on in the uh, second part of the class when we get to the, the current uh, research um, areas. Just to give you an outlook on what's going to be happening, there will be um, topics like augmented reality and uh, sketching in augmented reality to do design things in 3D. You can actually download the AR Pen app from the iOS App Store if you happen to have an iPhone uh, and uh, use it today. It's a, it's a free app that we, uh, that we developed. Um, uh, this is work by, uh, by Phil Abaka, one of my PhD students, and um, we'll also be looking at force input, especially force input on handheld devices. Oliver Novak, another one of our students, will be uh, giving you an overview of that exciting research area, um, and uh, Statsplora, and um, other tools that we've developed to create um, visualizations and, and programming environments that help people to do data science and exploratory programming. Exploratory programming is a style of programming that um, really goes a lot by small try and error and um, reusing lots of earlier results. People that typically use things like SPSS or, um, or LabVIEW that build their, you know, their code to analyze their data as a data scientist um, work a lot in this style and we've worked on quite a few tools um, to support it. Uh, Krishna will be talking about that area. Um, then we have um, an area called uh, personal fabrication. Uh, and this will be touching on a, on a big part of the, the work that's been going on here. Um, uh, Marcel Lahai will be presenting this. And uh, the basic thing be behind this is um, that uh, digital tools like 3D printers, laser cutters, and so on, have brought um, amazing capabilities to people to make stuff from you know, first principles, from just an idea in their head. Um, but there's also a big challenge on how to do that well, how to create the user interfaces so that, that somebody can create uh, an idea that they have in their head. And we have been working on this um, quite a bit. Um, Anki here, uh, who's, been, uh, who's also the major TA here for this class, the teaching assistant, um, will be talking about soft robotics and jewelry, um, an exciting new trend um, that uh, creates uh, kin you know, kinetic uh, machines or machines that can react from non-standard materials that, that are soft to the touch, that are flexible, that use pneumatics or, or shape memory alloys um, to create very unusual um, movement patterns and reactions. Um, and then finally, uh, Christian Cherik here um, will be talking about tangibles on tabletops, so the whole area of uh, tangible computing, things that you hold in your hand, uh, that uh, help you to understand concepts better by grasping them physically. Um, and this is in connect, uh, connected with a uh, 4K high resolution, uh, really huge um, tabletop that we have at the lab. It's actually just sitting a few um, steps away from our seminar room where we normally hold this class. Um, and this is a, a Microsoft Surface table um, that we use and put the tangibles on. And this creates a very interesting environment for real collaborative group work. Okay, so a couple words now uh, about the course structure. Um, the class is uh, structured so that we teach um, online via Zoom as like we do today. Um, and um, we'll be going over some basic concepts and HDI research methods and topics like this uh, in these classes here um, each Tuesday for the next few weeks. Uh, on Wednesdays, uh, we will um, hand out new assignments, uh, collect the old ones, and uh, you'll typically have to turn them in before the, uh, the lab so that the, the assignment can then be discussed during the lab. So standard practice for you guys. You know this from, from a lot of other lectures. Um, this will be going on from uh, you know, this, week, uh, this month here in April, roughly until uh, the uh, early June. And then um, the class will uh, transition there will be a midterm, which will focus on these topics. Uh, this is a midterm exam that, again, if you've taken DIS1, you know this, it's, it's part of your exam, it's part of your grade, um, and it's done after half of the semester to make sure that you guys can keep up with the material and that you have something that you can already pocket after 
half of the uh, semester is over. Um, after that, then we will get into uh, lectures on um, current topics. So there will be the classes on the things like the topics I just showed. Currently, we're hoping that we will be able to do those uh, in good old physical, you know, style. So you guys can actually join us in the uh, seminar room <coughs> rather than here on, on Zoom. Um, but who knows what uh, Corona will, will bring. So we're prepared for, for anything. Um, either way, the topics there will be the things that I showed on the last few slides. Um, I'll be doing some of these classes. But as I said, also our PhD students will do, will do their catwalk and introduce to you uh, the topics that are you know, at, uh, at the core of their hearts and that they're excited about. As an assignment to uh, accompany this, um, we will have you um, on the one hand read up on some of the research um, areas that we talk about, but also have a mini HCI research um, paper writing project so that you get a, some practice into how you actually do that. Um, after this, there will be the uh, final exam uh, actually coming up uh, on July 27th. So make sure not to book your um, vacation to the, to the Caribbean um, that week. Um, and then if you um, miss the uh, final uh, first uh, exam or uh, should actually fail it, there is a second chance final exam on the uh, 7th, uh, 17th of August. So that's the overall schedule. So please mark your calendars, especially for the June 8th. This may be an, an unusual date to, to where you have to be there. Uh, this is uh, technically a presence uh, übung, so a, a presence lab, if you like. Um, it feels very much like the, the final exam um, in terms of that we give you written questions that you have to answer within a given set of time. Again, we've done this in DS1, you probably uh, know this. Um, you may be wondering why we start so early. Um, quite a few classes in the computer science department start this early, but other classes start later when um, hopefully maybe even you know, April 20th, we will be able to go back to presence uh, teaching. Um, but uh, my point in starting this early was, was, first of all, I wanted to make sure that we can actually cover the material that we want to relate to your guys um, at a relaxed and, and evenly paced uh, speed. So we didn't want to bunch everything up more and more towards the end. Um, I'm also not 100% sure myself whether you know, Corona will allow us, uh, everybody, to restart the regular teaching on April 20th or whether it will get pushed back further. So we wanted to avoid that, that squeeze. Also, um, the class starts now, which means you probably have, not all your classes have started yet. So this gives you actually an ex excellent chance to get started on this stuff, you know, be well caught up with this. So you don't have a lot of stuff to catch up to later in this class when all these other classes are gonna be happening that will probably have their material squeezed a bit and uh, will probably take a bit of more effort to actually follow along with uh, correctly. So hopefully this will let you spread out your work uh, a little more evenly over the course of the semester. And of course, that's also the idea behind this um, class in general, that we want you to work on it continuously. It's not a class that you just basically say, oh, it's recorded. I'll watch all the videos in the last 72 hours before the exam, and then I'll write the exam. Uh, this won't work. First of all, you won't be able to learn things that quickly in, in a quality bed good enough to pass the exam. And also, you will be actually missing some of the points for your grade. Um, I'll talk about the grading structure in just a minute. Um, before we get to the grading uh, principles here, uh, let me talk about where our material is coming from. Um, in the beginning, we'll be going over some um, uh, you know, current books. But in the second part, when we talk about actual um, topics, current topics, uh, we will be mostly looking at the latest um, conferences that we've been able to attend ourselves or go through the proceedings ourselves. And these are basically the, um, the conferences that are at the top of the list for uh, technically oriented uh, human computer interaction in the world. So CHI, of course, is the, is the flagship conference for uh, HCI research uh, internationally. And we always try to send our best work there ourselves. And, uh, actually works out pretty well. We managed to publish quite a bit there, um, but we also have other um, high 
quality conferences um, that we look at. You won't see a lot of journal, journal articles here, a few, but not so much. HCI is a, is a research discipline that actually isn't using um, journals as much. It's actually more of a conference-oriented research field uh, where people meet and discuss their research rather than writing it down in, uh, in proceedings and just um, you know, having this written exchange. But um, before we get to those fun things, we will be going over research methods in HCI itself. And um, I want to recommend two books. One I want to really, really recommend strongly. Um, and this is the book, A Research Methods in HCI by Lazar. Um, he's done an excellent job, and it's a pretty recent um, publication too, um, of writing up how you actually do research in HCI. What methods do we have available to create um, academically sound results? Not just, oh, you know, I'll wave some colored, you know, pieces of cloth around and then I'll consider this interface more beautiful than this other one. Um, we're trying to get to hard facts, to hard data, um, have quantified methods that can measure success or, or failure or comparative performance of interfaces so that we can actually make informed statements about what a certain HCI interaction technique, for example, uh, is best at, whether it's the best choice for a particular setting, for example. So uh, the research methods in HCI Lazar book, um, the one that you can see there at the top, the yellow one is really highly recommended. Um, a lot about it is about evaluation methods. How do I test whether something is good or not good? Um, and especially if you're considering to do our thesis, to do your thesis at, your, at this chair, then um, uh, grab this book now and read it. You'll be reading it anyway, um, uh, because you will need the methods in there to do uh, your own thesis, most likely. Uh, there's a, the second one that goes a little deeper um, and is more um, psycholo psychologically um, oriented, I would say, Research Methods for the Behavioral Sciences um, by Graviter and Forzano. Um, this is also a recommended reading if you want to go into more detail about a particular experimental research method. Okay, so now how is your grade being compiled? Um, as I said, we want you guys to work on this class throughout the semester, as with all our classes, and we also want to honor the fact that you do this continuous engagement. So 25% of your grade will come out of your assignments and your HCI research project. Another 30% of your grade will come out of the midterm exam, which means by the, you know, the day that you walk into the final exam, you actually have more than half of your grade already in your pocket. Um, so if you stick with us, if you do your work every week and, and stay on track with this class, uh, you'll also have an easier time when the final exam rolls around, um, you know, which is when all the other classes are also having their exams, when you're in crunch mode anyway. So we hope that this gives you more, even more reason to uh, stick around and, and stay on track with uh, our assignments and our work and our progress um, and have a little bit of a more relaxed um, end of the semester through this arrangement. Now, you can have an even more relaxed end of the semester um, if you plagiarize. Uh, plagiarism, just to, uh, you know, we talk about this before every class, but we need to do it um, again, because we just want to make sure that people understand this 100%. Um, plagiarism means um, you reuse other people's intellectual work in, uh, in a publication or something without giving them proper credit. Um, so it's a bit, little bit like you know, breaking copyright um, in, in science and in scientific writing. Um, the top here is a site um, from, um, uh, from a conference paper. Um, I'll uh, put the site down. Uh, it's going to appear later on this slide. Now, there are a couple of ways. You know, let's say you read this in a paper and it's, in, it's important for your own work. Maybe you need to write a report on something um, and you find the source. Now, you might come up with the idea uh, that we can see here in the middle, which is I'm just going to take that text and put it, you know, word for word, going to put it into my own um, into my own um, paper. If you do this and you don't add the quotes and the citation, 
uh, that's plagiarism, okay? Because you just stole some text from somebody else and you should definitely give them credit, you know, with a little marker here at the end, you know, square brackets one, this is the citation telling me then in a footnote or in a collection of citations at the end of my paper, um, who said this? And also, since you're quoting verbatim, word for word, um, you need to put this into quotation marks. Now, some people read this stuff and then uh, they say, oh, okay, I read this. I'm not going to quote it word by word. I'm just going to rewrite it a bit um, and, and, and re-express it in my own words. That's okay. Both things are okay. If you write it in your own words, obviously you're not going to put quotation marks because now it's your own voice speaking. But if the key idea you are expressing is coming right out of that other piece of work, you still must cite it, okay? If you don't, it's still plagiarism. And this is something a lot of people don't get. You know, they think, oh, I read something, I'm just gonna rewrite it in my own words, and hey, it's my own words, I'm not citing anybody. Uh, well, yes, you are. You are citing their idea, even though you're not citing verbatim, you're not citing word for word. So, to avoid plagiarizing, either use you know, always cite where your the idea for what you're writing came from, where somebody made that statement that you are now making. Like usability testing has the largest impact on strategic improvement. Where is that coming from? Oh, it's from that book. So cite it or from that paper. And if you cite verbatim, word for word, put quotes around it. Um, while we're at this, um, websites are not a good citation source. Um, they are usually very up-to-date and some of the most recent developments can only be found online, but they can change tomorrow. The big difference that the whole academic community has managed to create is that they have a process in which written statements, written words, papers, journal articles at some point get frozen in and you know where to find it, you know who said it, you know exactly what they said because they're not able to change it after the fact. And it's something you can cite and you can always go back to. You will always find it again in some digital library or, you know, God forbid, in a, in a paper book. So this is not true for websites, especially Wikipedia, right? I mean, Wikipedia is a wonderful source of knowledge, nothing against it, but good Wikipedia art articles cite their own sources and tell you where it's coming from. Wikipedia is often called a tertiary uh, knowledge base. It's actually referring back to other people, people's works that then contain the citable, unmodifiable text that you can go back to and know for sure who wrote it, when they said it, so that you can understand, well, was this a statement that was made 15 years ago and things changed, or was it made only last week? Um, these things are super important, otherwise we cannot build trust um, on, you know, kind of cannot trustfully build on other people's results. So. Don't use websites as citations, um, especially um, not Wikipedia. Look for where Wikipedia got its stuff from. Usually it's some kind of book or paper, if it's a good article, and then go back to that. And that's something you can cite in an academic uh, article. So cite and quote instead of plagiarizing. Um, I'm harping on about this so much because um, if you plagiarize, it'll have dire consequences. First of all, you'll automatically fail this class. Um, we don't ask questions about that. We just fail you if we discover it. Um, you're now in an advanced HCI research class. Um, honestly, people who still haven't understood what plagiarism is in this, at this state um, don't deserve a second chance for like, oh, I didn't know, and can I go back? We do this sometimes, you know, in our like undergraduate first pro seminars, we're like, okay, they didn't know any better, although we said it, but um, here I think you guys are all grown up enough um, to know what plagiarism is, so don't do it. If you should be caught doing this repeatedly, uh, we'll kick you out of our classes. Um, there are um, ongoing repercussions that RVTH usually then triggers um, that can go all the way um, to a lawsuit. Um, and you know that you don't get a degree by that time, then should be obvious. Um, so sign, please sign the declaration of compliance. You could find it on our jump page, the URL I showed in the first slide. Uh, scan it in and send it to Anke. Um, if you want to do her a big favor, use CTHCI with square brackets as a prefix for your mail subject so she can sort through her onslaught of emails and find these quickly. 
Um, that's also a good idea for anything else um, you're writing that concerns this class. Mm -hmm. So declaration compliance, you know this from other, other classes, basically just confirms that you understand these rules and, and that you'll abide by them. This class has limited seats. Um, we only have 50 seats available. As of yesterday, I think we had 49 registrations, which is almost like you know magically hitting that number. Is that still true, Anka, or are we, are we up in registrations? I had 54 this morning, so it was a little bit up. Okay. Um, yeah, but I, I, I'm not sure. It still depends on if everybody's taking the class. So usually after a few days, some students would drop out. Yeah, so because we're starting today and we're gonna hand out an assignment um, pretty soon, uh, we want you guys to make your decision very quickly, if, if at all possible. So please register in RWTH online by the end of today, if you still haven't done that yet, but happen to somehow be in this, in this call, um, and uh, sign and uh, send the declaration of compliance to Anke. This is sort of you know, our minimum measurement of, yes, the student is actually alive. Right? They actually heard what we were saying and they are doing what we're asking them to do. Uh, which if we need to cut down on seats because we have too many people signed up uh, is one of the indicators that helps us understand um, if you're actually taking part of, or if you're just a Karteileiche, as we like to say in German. Just a dummy. Okay. Um, we restrict the number of people taking this class because we want to give high quality feedback. You will be writing scientific text and giving good quality feedback on that takes a lot of time um, and it just doesn't scale up well. So that's why we have to limit this to, uh, to these seats. All right, um, now uh, here's, um, here's a bit of um, an overview of the jump page that I just mentioned. Um, the jump page has a couple things. You can see the summary of what this class is about. Uh, and then on the top right, you have some class information, uh, when and where, in case you forget, you see the midterm final uh, dates posted there again. We also have a link to resources. So that is super useful. If you um, zoom in on that, uh, it'll tell you where to find the RWH online link, where you find the Moodle uh, rooms. Um, we also used to post things on iTunes U. Nowadays, uh, we've moved this over to, um, to YouTube. So the videos will be uploaded to YouTube shortly after the end of this class. Um, and you can also find um, slides on, uh, on the class there. So. Remember the jump page, it's your starting point for, for everything, okay? Um, this is where you would sign up, for example, in RFTH online to make sure that you have a seat in this class. Okay, uh, my recommendation is we are at the one hour 15, 45 minute mark exactly. So let's take a, a very short bio break. Everybody stretch your legs, uh, get a breath of fresh air, open your window get up, walk around, get some water, or get rid of some water, uh, whatever, and I'll see you again in just five minutes, okay? All right, welcome back. Um, let's dive in. Let's talk about how does HCI research actually work? Um, there's a wonderful paper by uh, Jacob Wobrock that he wrote uh, just a few years ago, um, and he managed to, he looked at, a, at HCI research um, at lots of Kai papers, um, and he managed to create sort of a classification of research contribution types, which I have always found super useful to understand what exactly it actually is that a paper is trying to do, and to also judge, depending on what kind of contribution it is, whether they've actually validated their contribution appropriately. So if it's actually a, you know, a paper that makes a, a valid point that, that I can trust, or whether it is maybe missing some, some aspects in its validation so that I'm not 100% sure whether the findings they report are actually things that I can rely on. Um, let me first give you an overview of these uh, contribution types. By the way, uh, you will find, as with other classes recently, we've cut this up into what we call little chapters, uh, which will be things that we chap uh, that we divide uh, for easier um, access in the, in the video library. So the seven research contribution types that, um, that Warbrock introduced in 2016 describe 
um, basically each type that um, uh, Wobrock found uh, briefly, then they explain um, how this kind of contribution is acquired, how, how you get to the contribution, how you validate it, how you show that it's true, and also gives interesting hints on how others should be reviewing that contribution types. Um, plus, he for each paper type, he gives some examples from the actual literature of Kai. Um, and uh, Jacob got honored with a, with a social impact award recently. Um, he's received like 19 paper awards, seven best papers. So he's really an, a very well known, very successful and really good HCI researcher. Um, he's also worked a lot in, in um, social responsibility uh, work. And um, he, for example, made he was the, his slide rule project was the first that actually made touchscreen devices uh, like smartphones accessible to blind people um, and influenced how, how Apple later designed the voiceover feature on, um, on, on, on its iOS devices. So really great guy. Um, I really like him. I've met him a lot at, at conferences and such. Um, so his research in general is very interesting, but this paper in particular makes a wonderful uh, stab at, at classifying what's going on in HDI. So in order to write this, um, he looked at uh, papers from Kai 2016, uh, and he showed how they were uh, actually structured. So what you can see here is the Kai 2016 papers by contribution type. Uh, and this already gives you an idea of what these uh, contribution types are. They're down at the base there, these one, two, three, four, five, six, Seven. Actually, it's, um, it's divided. The first one, the empirical study one, is divided up into two subgroups. Um, so, seven contribution types down at the x-axis, and then on the y-axis, you can see um, how many percent of the papers um, actually contained that contribution type. Now, there's two things important here to, with this graph to understand. First of all, you're actually looking at three graphs. The gray graph shows you. Uh, the percentage of papers submitted to Kai that year that were of that con that contained that contribution type. But since Kai only accepts about a quarter of its papers that get submitted, so it's a very selective, um, tough conference to get into. Um, you can also see in the blue um, line of all the accepted papers. Um, so the uh, papers that made it into con into what's called the conference program that were actually featured at the conference. Um, how many of those papers were of each contribution type. And you'd normally accept, uh, is, expect those things to be the same, right? You know, if I submit more papers with theory contributions, you would also expect more papers with theory contributions to get accepted. But we'll see there's some um, imbalancing here, which kind of tells you already what the HCI community is looking for and how hard it is to make a particular type of contribution. And the orange uh, graph then, the, the third bar in each column here, um, is actually the acceptance rate for that type of contribution, which basically just takes, um, you know, show, shows you the same thing that you can see if you look at the other two graphs as well. If the, say, the blue graph is higher than the gray one, then that means you have a relatively above average acceptance rate, uh, whereas if it's, if it's lower, then you have a below average acceptance rate. <coughs> So um, let's look at this. So empirical study of system use is the first uh, category. Oh yeah, the second thing I should mention about this graph, uh, it adds up to more than 100%, uh, which makes perfect sense because a lot of papers have more than one kind of a contribution in them. So in fact, uh, he found that about 30% of the papers indicated more than one kind, kind of contribution. Most of them have an empirical contribution. You can see 44% of all papers that were submitted to Kai that year had what's called an empirical contribution, which we'll get to this in more detail, but basically means I compared, I studied, I measured something, an empirical result that tells me um, a finding from observing somebody using a system or people trying out a computer or typing as fast as they can with different keyboards or input devices, this kind of stuff. Um, and the study, study of system use and study of people are very related. Um, 
it's more about the focus, whether it's more on, on humans or more on the technology. Um, but those were clearly the two biggest contribution types. Um, we can also see that they have um, a pretty good acceptance rate. Then we get to a lot of uh, um, papers at CHI have an artifact contribution or system contribution. This is us, guys. This is the computer science scientists, the engineers, uh, the electrical engineers building stuff. Right? An artifact contribution or a systems contribution means I have created a new thing, whatever that is, software, hardware, usually both or often both. Um, and this is what I'm bringing to the table. But by itself, a new system is just an invention, right? I'm just an inventor. What makes you into an academic, into a scientist, and, and what makes it a scientific contribution is if you not just present the artifact, but also validate that it has, actually has some benefits that make it worth looking at, often just in particular settings. You know, I invent a new input device from smartphones, and it doesn't work well, but if you are walking, it's by far the best of anything out there. You know, that's, a, that's an important contribution, for example. So um, next up, then, we have um, methods which then means you submit actually kind of uh, a, a recipe for a process on how to do something, a new way of measuring. You know, Fitts law um, would fall maybe in method, would probably actually fall in theory um, as, as, a, as a big you know, fundamental principle, which is the next graph. But method could be some, something like GOMS, for example, um, which you know from DS1 if you've listened to it. Um, and then we have things like essays or arguments which you can see are very few submissions at CHI, and even fewer of those relatively get um, accepted. Um, sometimes people also submit uh, literature surveys or meta-analysis. So the paper we're looking at with Jacob Warbrock's own paper would probably fall into providing a meta-analysis or literature survey. At least that's one of the contributions because he actually took all the um, you know, 2,316 submissions to CHI-16 and looked at them and figured out what the contribution type was. The last one down there is a data set. So for example, this is very well known in, uh, let's say, computer vision or language processing, where you often have people submitting a data set, which is a collection of, uh, for example, images, and then all the people are measuring using these images. But also, um, for example, um, Antti Ulas Virta has done some amazing work collecting data from lots and like millions of keystrokes that people do and uh, provides this data set of, you know, to the community so that they can do research on it. And how do people type? What kind of, you know, you can ask all sorts of questions when you use a data set. The data set is there for other people to use. Anyway, that gives you a first glimpse of these, um, uh, these contribution types. And um, don't make the mistake thinking that, oh, data sets aren't worth anything because there's so few of them. They're just as valuable as an empirical study or an artifact or something like this. It's just, it doesn't happen as much. There aren't as many um, obvious questions uh, you know, that make people write meta-analyses or, or, or create data sets as there are empirical studies of systems and people. Those are just abundant. The opportunities, the research opportunities are abundant, so a lot of people do this kind of work, and Kai is very comfortable with it and knows it very well. The reviewers know it very well. They know how to evaluate it, how to tell good from bad, and sometimes that's not so easy with the contribution types that are less common. Let's look at this first um, sort of biggest kind of contribution that we see there, uh, the empirical contributions. These are based on observation and data gathering. So that means we observe a system in operation, a user using a system or users collaborating in a, using a system and we collect data about it. Uh, that could be from a controlled experiment, um, which you've heard a bit about in DIS1 um, where, you know, you measure um, are people typing faster with uh, keyword A layout than keyword layout B? Or it could be a, a, a more qualitative user test 
you could be running observations in a lab or in the field out there in, in, in you know, the user's workplace. You could be interviewing people and collecting the data from interviews. You could be doing surveys where you send out you know, uh, questionnaires and, and ask for feedback on, online. Um, you might be working with focus groups where you go into you know, in-depth workshops trying to figure out exactly what they need and how they work. You could ask people, that's been, that's been done as well, it's a, it's a valid research method, to, uh, to do diaries. So you design a new way of, let's say, turning on a smartphone and you ask people just to use it for you know, four weeks and just at the end of each week, day, uh, something pops up on the smartphone, ask them to, to write, write down how they used it today, how it worked, where it bothered them, where it helped them. Ethnographies, where you study, you know, the the structure and the um, of of um, how different kinds of people work with the system. Um, you could also collect your data using sensors. You know, um, I might write a a program, let people use the program, and not ask them anything about it because all the interesting data that I need is being collected by the um, you know the smartphone sensors, for example, uh, during usage. That might be enough to do. Um, or in other kinds of log files, you know, where the system automatically logs events, for example. This is a very common thing that we often do. Um, when we had research going on on our multi-touch table, for example, we logged every single event, and Anke can talk about this at length because she had to analyze that data, um, you know, putting down uh, tangibles on the table, lifting them up, moving them around, um, you know, what people were touching, etc. So you can log all this data with software in, in your code, you instrument your, your, your application, basically your test application for your user study, and then you've got those log files. Really hard to get these, uh, all these data sources combined and to make them really merge so that they actually belong together and make sense. Also hard to know what to look for in all that data noise, but um, those are the sources that you might be using. So those are all empirical contributions that use these methods, observing, data gathering, and then making claims based on that. How do you evaluate it? Two ways. First of all, it's got to be an important finding. Ha ha, very surprising. You know, if somebody writes this paper and then says, oh, I discovered that people who use, um, I don't know, green backgrounds tend to be 0.3% more likely uh, to buy vegetables or something. Actually, maybe that is an important finding. I don't know, but I'm trying to make stuff up, right? So there could be a finding that isn't very exciting, that won't mean a lot to the community, but you could also have a really important finding. You know, maybe the finding um, is something very fundamental. For example, you say, I actually discovered that people these days type faster on smartphones than keyboards. If that is true, and that would be a super important finding, right? Because that would really change the understanding of the whole community about input. Then there comes, of course, the second question. Is your finding sound? Or did you actually do a good job of testing your claim? Are you actually, do you actually have the data to back up your claim, what you say is your finding? So that's what you would look for when you look at a paper. You ask yourself, is the thing they studied really important? And usually the more limited the, you know, the user base is for, for uh, which something is being claimed, the harder it is to make the finding really important. You know, you might find something, but it only is true in so specific circumstances, uh, circumstances that it isn't really important for the community at large. And you look for the soundness. So you look at how did they get arrive at this finding? Was their um, study well designed? Did they use a balanced group of users that matches what they claim they are designing for? Um, did they have enough users? Are their findings you know, significantly different? Did they use the right kinds of statistics approach at all to, uh, to show what they're uh, claiming they can show? Um, here's an example of this kind of typical um, uh, work that, that basically creates empirical results. Now, importantly, you can do an empirical study and publish a high profile CHI paper, get a best paper award, and have not invented anything. This is important to understand. We engineering types like to think that we need to create something new to you know, create contribution, but that's not true. You could just look at existing systems 
and do a study and find out something important about how these existing systems work. And that's in fact what the empirical contribution claims. It just says, I learned something about a system. It doesn't say anything about whether that system has to be new or whether it can be an existing one. If it's a new system, then you usually also have an artifact contribution. So let's look at this example here. These guys basically uh, used um, five off the shelf mobile devices um, to reflect what an actual user would experience. And you can see from the devices here, this is now like 10 years old, but it doesn't matter, right? It's, it's just about how they work and what they did. Um, and they, what they wanted to find out is how well do soft buttons on touch screens work compared to hard buttons? You know, you know, hard buttons are the buttons that are actually physically there and soft buttons are the ones that you put, you know, at the side of your screen oftentimes that you then trigger with hard buttons or maybe with a, with a touch stylus um, on the screen or with your finger on the screen, which we do now these days, uh, nowadays mostly on our smartphones because they don't have hardly any hard buttons anymore. So what did they do? Um, they ran three empirical experiments. Uh, the first one tested the operating mode, whether you use a finger or stylus. So they changed the finger and stylus as an uh, independent variable. Um, and they changed the feedback types, acoustic versus haptic. The second one uh, looked at the activation mechanism. Like how was the um, soft button touch being detected? How did the touch screen work basically? Was it a um, resistive touch screen which you need to actually poke a bit and exert a little pressure, a little force to create the uh, touch? Or was it one that uh, worked uh, on contact with capacitive touch which we now use in our smartphones? And the third uh, thing they tested in the third experiment was the button size. They varied the button size and they varied the activation mechanism. Those were their independent variables uh, that they could tweak, that they could control. What did they measure? Well, they measured standard things, input accuracy, how precise are people creating input? How fast are they? Speed and accuracy or error rates are usually like the staple um, measurements that people do in these kinds of studies because this is just about how well can I input something that I already know I want to input. It's not about coming up with what I want to type. It's I want to type this in. How fast can I be? How precise can I be? How many corrections are people making? This was basically another measurement of input accuracy. So they these were all observations they could make or measurements they could make from observations. But they also measured things from subjective ratings, which means you ask people, right? Um, so they asked people about their subjective rating, how they liked the soft versus hard buttons. And this is a wonderful example for good triangulation, right? Um, you should always observe your users, but also ask them, talk to them so that you understand why they're doing something. This is not something you can tell from just watching them. But oftentimes, as you know from DS1, people will tell you something else than what they actually do because they rationalize in their own head. Um, and that means you also need to observe to see whether you know, they actually do what they tell you they would be doing. Results were actually interesting. They found, for example, um, that soft buttons with feedback um, for dialing phone numbers um, and using a calculator, so they tried this with calculator and phone um, input, offered similar performance sometimes even superior compared to hard buttons in handheld devices, which was very surprising at the time because this was 2009. The iPhone had just hit the market two years earlier. Um, so this showed that soft buttons were actually doing really well in terms of actual performance. Um, they also showed that uh, a stylus input could actually be able to more accurately handle smaller buttons uh, and that it depended less on the synthetic feedback, like, you know, for example, uh, haptic uh, feedback by making the device, you know, go puck when, when, you, when you touch the screen, uh, than the finger. So this was basically a, a word in favor of the stylus, interestingly. And then either audio or vibrotactile feedback both improved soft touch uh, button performance. But if you combine both, you make a sound and you make a vibration as a result, you don't get any further improvement. So 
as we normally say in DIS1, um, you know, load more channels with feedback and it's usually better. We will talk about this actually also in DIS2, the other class happening this semester, um, isn't always an improvement. Um, and the performance differences were for the activation mechanisms like contact capacitor versus force activation resistance were actually very subtle, but uh, the behavior that people did was quite different in, in using them. Anyway, I don't want to go too deep into the details of this paper. What I wanted to show you is this is work that is an empirical result. You know, really good. All these papers you can find in the ACM digital library. Um, I need to take a short um, interlude here uh, and point out that uh, the ACM Digital Library is where um, our entire lab basically finds 90% of their research um, because all the conferences that look into HCI are usually sponsored by the Association of Computing Machinery or ACM for short. Um, and if you are um, um, on the RWH network, um, you need to create an account with the ACM Digital Library. It's free, it doesn't cost you anything. Once you've created an account, then you can log on to the ACM Digital Library. You should do this from inside the RWH network. You can use VPN if you're at home. Uh, and once you've done that, then for six months, your account is actually unlocked for full access, even if you're not using VPN. So ACM Library, uh, thanks Anke for posting the, the link in the, uh, in the chat here, um, dl.acm.org is your source for finding pretty much all the literature that we'll be pointing you to. And thankfully, as of April 1st, so just last week, uh, a licensing issue got resolved between the university and ACM so that we now can give you this full uh, feedback that you guys should have. I'm really happy that this worked out. Uh, it was a big struggle for, for several months. Um, all right. So here's another example from our own lab for uh, an empirical contribution. And this is actually uh, work that Anke had a big part in. Um, do you want to talk about this, Anka? maybe? Tell people what's going on here? Yeah, I can do that. So yeah, basically, um, this work is uh, also was the part of my, of my master thesis. Um, so this is the, the tabletop that Professor Borges talked about earlier that is setting in our lab. And um, as Christian Jago is doing the research with tangibles a lot, and it has been a big topic in, in the lab, uh, there was still this open question of whether tangibles make people more aware than virtual objects on the screen. So what we actually did, okay, we said let's uh, discuss this question and um, set up a study that we can test that. So we set up an exper empirical experiment. Um, we had groups of two to four users playing a game grabbing the attention of them because the, the goal was that people would not know what we are, uh, are actually testing, which was important because it was about their awareness, so they shouldn't be aware of what they were doing. Um, so we had this game, it was uh, whack a mole I think probably a lot of you know this game. And people had, um, you see now in the screen, two people standing on the left, there are other two people standing on the right. Each of them had their own kind of uh, playing area and they had to whack these molds. And from time to time, um, people would, uh, so one of the enemies would put uh, an object on one of your holes. And this would mean this, ob this, this hole is closed and you cannot break molds anymore. And the other on, um, um, opposite would also steal points from you in that moment. So actually the, the player had to take attention, uh, had to be aware of what the others are doing. And if they would realize that, they had to put a shield that is on top uh, in each screen put on the same hole to get the points back. Um, so they were playing this game five minutes for each uh, round and we were logging all the data. So how many times would people attack? How much time did the, did the other uh, person need to uh, be aware of the attack? Uh, and we played this game also in virtual and with tangible objects to have a comparison in the end. Um, so actually the biggest measure was the speed of the reaction time. And um, when we got all the uh, data, we then um, used the different, different uh, tests and um, statistical tests that we also discuss in this lecture later on. Uh, it will happen in four to five weeks. Um, and found that the tangibles actually make people more aware of what, of what is happening around them. 
we also found that probably this uh, being aware is not only because of the virtual object, it's because also of the characteristics. So um, the, of the tangible. The tangible, for example, has also the characteristic of making a sound when you move it over the table um, that virtual objects wouldn't have. So probably this was also a point where people would actually realize that something is happening. But yeah, as this is one of the tangible characteristics, we found that there's actually a difference between these two um, options. All right, thank you, Anke. Um, so, so you can see this, this work also involved um, an artifact contribution, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, because we had to build those tangibles. Um, but then the study itself was such a major part of the work that it was uh, an empirical contribution uh, that would have been just as interesting and valid if it had been using existing technology uh, because somebody else had built the tangibles, right? So knowing that tangibles actually, uh, in a collaborative setting, make people more aware of what others are doing um, rather than using just the objects on a screen was the, the key finding of that paper. Um, and uh, this was a typical empirical study, uh, empirical contribution in that paper. Okay, and in this case, I think it's a good example because we didn't build the tangibles um, and wanted the tangibles to be the new crazy thing. People have been doing tangibles before, but the key thing we wanted to know here was, does this effect exist? So the key finding was this empirical finding, is there an effect on user's awareness if you use tangibles? We just had to build the, the apparatus, as they call it, the, the, the prototype, the research prototype, to make that study possible. Um, but it was a typical research prototype, um, which I like the comparison that every research prototype is really a question. You build it to answer a question. You don't build it to fulfill a task or to work perfectly for people every day. You have a specific question that you want answered, and that's why you build your system to test that question. Which gets us to the, um, to the next kind of contribution. So um, artifact contributions are, um, after empirical contributions, the next biggest uh, section that you will typically find in HCI research. Um, and artifact contributions are driven by new systems, new software architectures, or new uh, software tools and apps, or maybe toolkits and libraries and frameworks that people develop. Or also, and that is a big one, of course, um, new interaction techniques in, you know, implemented in software or sketches of ideas how new systems could work. Um, they arise from um, what we could call design-driven activities. So they usually are created generatively. They are inventions, if you want, to start with. And then we make them into science by evaluating them and validating that they work well for a particular area so that other people don't just see, oh, this looks cool and this guy really likes it, that, who made it, but they can also tell, oh, and I can actually apply this new technique in this situation and then it will actually be better than anything else I can use. Um, empirical contributions, on the other hand, that we just looked at, often come from what's called descriptive or discovery-driven activities, um, you know, which is the typical scientific approach. This is also why it's actually not easy to do good artifact contribution papers, because you need to build something that is significantly new um, so that the artifact in itself is a contribution, and then you need to validate it so that you actually show that it actually has a benefit against anything else out there, that, you know, your strongest competitors, and this is tough. But we still do it a lot because you know this is kind of the unique mix of skills that we have uh, in our lab is between computer science um, and HCI as a research area. Oftentimes these artifacts are um, mock-ups or envisionments or um, prototypes. They are usually not fully built, full-fledged systems. You know, nothing that you would let loose immediately on the general um, uh, public which often leads to misunderstandings because you, you create a research prototype that shows that this interaction technique of, I don't know, force pressing to select something on the screen works well. And then people are like, oh, I want to see this on my iPhone tomorrow. Well, 
it's still a long way to, to a product once you've created this artifact, even if it works well as a research prototype. Um, a good artifact contribution explains um, that it basically, um, it, it, if you want, it enables new exploitations. Uh, it lets you explore a new area and it suggests new insights, maybe possible, possible futures, you know. We have something that uh, allows people to suddenly build, this happened in 2005, allows people suddenly to build an, uh, a touch screen, a multi-touch screen using just a piece of acrylic, some LEDs and, and a camera and a projector. This was unheard of at the time and really enabled a lot of labs then to work on multi-touch research. You know, the original paper that introduced multi-touch uh, by Jeff Hahn was pretty much just a, an artifact contribution. It just proposed a technique to build a multi-touch you know, table for 50 bucks you know, or maybe 100. Um, and that was really, uh, really exciting. Um, they're evaluated as, as such by um, what they make possible. For example, a toolkit. Uh, let's say you write a new user interface toolkit that can recognize um, you know, in the air gestures um, in addition to touchscreen gestures. Um, then you enable uh, new interactions and new applications that can use it. Um, the performance is often a big deal. So if you uh, create a new interaction technique, and we've done this a lot, um, you need to show that under which circumstances it is actually better than everything else, anything else out there. If you create a new input technique um, for mobile touch selection uh, that uses force, like uh, one of our PhD students did, and you'll hear about this in the course of uh, the semester, you need to show why this is so much better uh, than anything else and under what conditions. And sometimes also uh, it's a, more about, you know, if you have a sketch that, that really just proposes a new design, I'm thinking of, um, you know, the, the design you saw by, that Alan Kay created in the 70s where he sketched this person sitting under a tree holding something that very much looks like an iPad from today's point of view. But he sketched this in the 70s and said, like, this would be my Im imagining of how people could interact with this technology and this is how this technology should work and this is what it shouldn't do and the, what it should do to allow people to learn, you know, on the go, etc. So the innovation insights uh, that come from these sketches are, are also often interesting. For some artifacts, uh, you may find that a plain old empirical study can be harmful because maybe it's just not the right thing to do. Maybe you have created something that is so new in its way of interactions that enables that you cannot run a good study because there's nothing to compare to. So uh, you have to be careful how you validate your artifacts. Um, oftentimes what we resort to, to an artifact contribution is called tire kicking, at least that's what I call it, where you basically show how far does this thing work? If I create a technique, I need you know, an interval technique, I can study, does it still work when people are using it while on the go, while they're walking? Does it still work on small screens, on big screens with multiple people? How fast is it? How precise can it be? So I measure, I push the envelope and I try to find out how much can this technique hold up to uh, you know, abuse in, in different settings and when does it break down? Here's an example. Um, again, this is work from our own lab, but uh, in the article by Wobrock, which you'll be reading, uh, you'll find more examples. Um, so we added this one here. This is Springlets, which was published just last year at um, Kai by Noor Hamdan, who's about to write up her uh, PhD these weeks. Um, and this was um, a new way of using shape memory alloys. These are little springs out of metal that will contract a lot when current flows them and they get warm. Uh, they're used to you know, control flaps in, in aeroplanes, so they're very strong and very lightweight. Um, and we used these materials to create very thin, flexible, tactile interfaces that are super easy to make. You just basically use this SMA, you use a little bit of uh, 3D printed or laser cut uh, uh, materials around it for the actuator. You put some sticky tape on your skin and you connect um, you know, a voltage uh, source to it. And um, in order to find out whether what this was able to do, we created some examples of how effective they were, what kind of tactile input we could create. For example, um, the one in the middle would simply um, move a little scratcher across the skin when, when it was pulled to the left and right. 
um, the one on the top left on the earlobe there, uh, that would, uh, in our idea, uh, tug Marcel's earlobe ever so slightly when his girlfriend sent him an SMS. Um, so those were application examples that we showed. The, the one at the bottom show, left shows um, a pedestrian could get navigation cues in four directions uh, while walking around without having to look at their smartphone. Or the one on the right shows somebody in virtual reality when they're wearing a backpack and the backpack gets heavier could get a short signal on their shoulder that, that sort of simulates this increase of weight of, your, of their backpack. So these are application examples. They're not a validation. They're more a, an argument why this could be interesting, why it's important, not while it's sound. So uh, for the soundness, we studied the effectiveness, how well people could detect uh, input with these and how wearable they were, if they would fall off or if people would um, find them getting too warm or anything like that. And we ran an empirical study on figuring out what actuators worked on which locations of the body, wrist, upper arm, shoulder, neck, chest, back, and so on, and whether they worked only while you're sitting or also while you're walking. Again, this paper is also in the ACM the Digital Library. This one you'll also find on our homepage um, and is an example in addition to the ones that Jacob Warbrock provides for empirical uh, contributions. Now, um, we will wrap up the discussion of um, Jacob's um, uh, different computation types here for today. Uh, we've got a few more to cover, which we'll do next week. Um, thank you everybody um, for listening in and uh, being part of this uh, experiment here in the, in the age of Corona. I really appreciate you joining us. Um, let's hope that we can continue this kind of class feedback. If you've got anything else you found about this um, uh, video Zoom conference here, please feel free to send Anke a note uh, via email after the fact, if you'd like. Um, and join us again tomorrow um, for the lab, tomorrow afternoon. And don't forget to sign up for the class and send us your declaration of compliance signed so that we know that you're alive and uh, willing and eager to take this class. Thanks very much, and I'll see you again soon. Bye. <laughs> Bye, everybody. This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.